We're moving fat rapidly. <clears throat> All right, let's open with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the love you have shown to us. We are your disobedient children. We don't deserve to be called your children, and yet, yet you love us anyway, and you forgive us. You, When we need to, um, you confront us, you get in our way to prevent us from hurting ourselves to a considerable degree, and, and we, we thank you for that, but we also know that at times you allow us to hurt ourselves so that we can learn from our mistakes because we don't learn very well otherwise just from you telling us what to do. And so we pray that you be with us tonight and and talk to us through your word and, and speak to us, tra- change our hearts so that we follow you not out of fear of, of the consequences, but out of love for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Before we start, just a reminder for anybody that's watching this online, live or later, um, that uh, it, wherever you're watching this, feel free to leave comments. Um, you can go to shepherdoftheridge.org uh, to interact with us there. We have forums there and um, and other ways to interact, the downloadable study, and, um, and uh, we'd be happy if the study's still going on when you see this, you, um, we'd be happy to discuss your comments at a later date. And um, and if you're uh, and you can also use the Twitter tag SOTR Genesis to um, to leave comments there. So um, so today we're talking about Genesis chapter eleven one through nine, uh, the Tower of Babel. Oh, before we go any further, I have to correct myself on something. Last week I said that there's only one word for um, for mountain um, for mountain or hill. And I was wrong, all right? There are two in Hebrew. Um, and, and one of them, and, and, and ironically, it was in um, one of today's, it was in today's reading that it referred to the mountain or high hill. And, and I, <laughs> it, was, it was like, it was two different words there. And I went, huh? Oh, wait a minute. And I looked at it and sure enough. And, um, and so there is a sort of a distinction where one is, is higher and one is is lower, mm-hmm. but but the 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 one um, it's it's not the same as the way we use hill or mountain. There's a lot sort of vaguer difference between them, and and where we when we say mountain, we think like really high snow cap kind of thing. Um, you know, with them, it's sort of anything that's tough to climb is you know. Um, or something that's, it's, well, that's pretty hot. <laughs> so like sort of what a, you know, what a, a um, small child might call a mountain or, you know, or something like that. So, uh, it's, a, it, it's still, it's not a direct translation, but there, I, I do have to, you know, there are two different words for that. So, okay. So, uh, Genesis chapter 11 verses one through nine. Somebody want to read? Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this and nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. All right. <clears throat> skip <something. clears throat> did I skip something? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was having a hard time reading it. If you did, I did too. So. <laughs> okay. At the same time. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, um, first question. Uh, they decide to build this tower, and... Um, in, in, in verse 5, it says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. 
Why did God have to go down to see the tower? Can he see it from heaven? Yeah. So, so what does that mean? Well, he really didn't have to. <laughs> right? This is, this is actually a joke. This is a Hebrew joke. <laughs> All right, but see, they're trying to. You know, they said, "Don't you had to catch the punchline." <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, they um, you know, let's let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. All right, so they build this tower that reaches to the heavens, and God goes, "It's so far down there." I have to go down and see it. I, you know, <laughs> it's so it's so puny that I can't see it from up here. It's you know, it's basically it's God mocking them, saying, "Oh yeah, your 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 big high tower that I can't even see it from up here. It's so small." <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's it's sort of God giving perspective here, and and um, that oh yeah, that's that's uh yeah, pretty impressive there. Uh huh. <laughs> Okay. Um and by the way, you see in the picture there, it's this a fairly decent picture. It's um <clears throat> a lot of times I, I've seen pictures of the Tower of Babel that looks sort of like um sort of like the, the leaning tower of Pisa, only, you know, straight up. All right. It wasn't just a, a straight up tower, it was more of this sort of uh, what we'd call a ziggurat. Um this sort of steps. Um because that's how they built if you wanted to build something big, they didn't have, you know, steel girders and and things like that. And so the only way that you could build something really tall was um, to make it sort of uh, pyramid-shaped. And uh, while the <clears throat> the Egyptians actually built pyramids that were relatively flat-sided, um, uh, most people in that um, uh, up to that point would have built these sort of, if you're trying to build something really tall, you build this sort of stepped um kind of design and um <clears throat> it's not that we have the uh it's not like they've located the the place where this is as far as i know um but that they <clears throat> excuse me they uh that that was the only way you could build a tower back then so um, just sort of a little architectural note. <clears throat> All right, why was God so upset with the people? Doesn't he like people working together? Now, let's go back to verse 6. This is the question. Yeah, the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Would that, would that answer pretty much answer? Yeah. So, what? but why is that bad? Because they were doing it for the wrong reasons. They were doing it for like personal recognition, you know. Um, Good works type of thing. <laughs> yeah, what, what was this really a tower? What was this a monument <laughs> to? Them. Them. <laughs> look at <laughs> us <laughs> and look how awesome <laughs> we <laughs> are. <laughs> look what we can do. And now you also have to consider, all right, these are these are Noah's descendants. All right, but um, these people are um, <clears throat> we we kind of know from from past history what these people are like, um, because they're human beings and we know what human beings are like, right? You get them all together in in one place, right? And no matter how well intentioned, even those who are well intentioned. Eventually, it doesn't go well for them. I mean, I've 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 read some on uh, sort of how long the Earth can can last. You know, they talk about well, the sun is slowly expanding, and you know, and all this kind of stuff. But actually, mankind, um, really, uh, by by most estimates, only has if Jesus doesn't come back first, um, like maybe ten twenty thousand years left before we destroy each other somehow. And that, and that's like, uh, that's on the, um, a sort of optimistic <laughs> estimate. 
I mean, you look at how close we've come so far just in the past 50 years or so. Well, that's good. Then I won't have to see it. Then. <laughs> I won't be here to see that. But, I, you know, I mean, you, you know, you look at the Cold War and how close we came so many times. Oh. You know, you look at, at people now yeah, that, really. um, you know, it's... You, you leave human beings to themselves for any given period of time. And, <laughs> you know, even you look at these sort of religious communes and stuff like that that have, have tried to build this sort of perfect utopian society. Oh, well, we'll get rid of all the bad people and, um, you know, and we'll all cooperate and live in peace together and all this kind of stuff. Like, yeah, it doesn't work because you're ignoring the fact that you're bad, too. <laughs> so, um, you know, so God's saying great so we've got all these evil people and we cram them together and what happens you know there's a reason that he told them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth right spread out because then you can't do as much damage to each other right um and and really the biggest problem here is, is, is what is this this is this is an idol it's, it's an idol to themselves right so um they're saying look at us and and so what is the what what what's the 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 greatest evil that they could accomplish? Idolatry. Idolatry. Mm -hmm. And they're already doing that. And they're building this huge. This wasn't just a golden calf or something like that. This is let's build this gigantic monument to ourselves. This is sort of um, not. It's not just a temple. It's not just a whatever. It's let's build the biggest thing that we can possibly think of, and. and you know, that's, that's going to be hard to get rid of, you know. So, and when you're worshiping yourself, you're, that's not even like, well, we're trying to figure out who God is and, and we just sort of miss the, um, the, the description or something like that. They just said, oh, heck with God, we're going to worship ourselves. It's very popular today, too. Um, why is nothing, oh. Well, okay, we've kind of talked about this a little bit. Why is nothing would be impossible for them a bad thing? Do we answer that? I think we covered it, didn't we? Kind of. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> if anybody else has anything to add with that. All right, so how is unity in Christ different from Babel unity? Does Babel unity just mean talk? Well, the not... the Babel, as in, like, the people of, of the Shinar Valley. All right, they were all okay. unified. All right, they were all working toward a common goal. All right, well, Christians all work toward a common goal, too, or we should, certainly should be. All right, how is, how is what we're doing different from what they were doing? We were worshiping God. Okay. They were worshiping. They weren't worshiping God. They were worshiping the temple. Yeah, yeah. They're worshiping themselves, and right. Whereas for us, it's it's and it's <clears throat> as Christians, our goal as we come together is to glorify God, and it's also to serve our neighbor instead of ourselves. This was completely self-serving. No, they were all together. So it's it's not that they were. Um, it's not that they were saying, well, you know, we need to go out and, and help our neighbor. There was nobody else, right? Um, but at the same time, it's it's it wasn't like, let's help each other. It was everybody saying, I'm going to help me. And they all just had that same idea. And it worked It worked out that that they were all unified in that. Well, let's, let's collectively be self-serving. All right, how is this event undone in Acts chapter 2? Anybody have a hint at what that would be? The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Pentecost. What happened at Pentecost? It 
figured out they were speaking in tongues. Right. So the language. Yeah. Yeah, and um, here in Genesis 11, the people were unable to communicate with each other because the language was confused. In Acts chapter 2, individuals were able to speak in multiple languages in order to communicate. So in a sense, Babel had been undone, at least for that time, so that they could communicate that message. And in fact, we see that that tongue speaking went on uh, for a certain period of time afterward. Um, there are those who say it still continues today. Um, while I've, I, I've seen and heard people doing what they claim to be tongue speaking, um, it's just, well, babbling, um, ironically, uh, it's not, they're not actually talking in any known language, and so that kind of defeats the purpose, because the whole point of, of speaking in, in tongues was that they were able to communicate the gospel to other people that they wouldn't normally be able to communicate it to, and, um, and so if you're just babbling and nobody even knows what you're saying, then that's not helping anybody. And, and Paul talks about that too, that it's, it, it's, it's only a benefit to you and it's not a benefit to anybody else, um, then it's not worth doing. Okay, so now kind of uh, zooming in on, on the present. All right, some people see the United Nations and or our sort of global economy or, or um, the majority of the world being able to speak English as another babble. Do you agree or disagree? And why? All right. These people were all unified. All right. They could all communicate with each other. All right. And they got into all kinds of problems. All right. Well, so God confused their languages and spread them out. Well, nowadays, even though we're spread out all over the world because of um, you know, the internet and stuff like that. We can communicate with people all over the world. Okay. Um, I can talk face to face with somebody on the other side of the world anytime I want. And there's, um, you know, and, and most people nowadays know English. There's even, um, I've seen, uh, stuff for phones where you can actually talk to somebody in another language and, um, and, it will give a, a readout on their phone of what you're saying in or in whatever language they speak, mm -hmm. and then they talk to you, mm -hmm. and then it translates it for you. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect. <laughs> the, the voice recognition isn't always right, but um, but you know, as a concept, it, it, it's really breaking down the language barriers and allowing uh, just about anybody mm -hmm. to communicate. Right. And so the question is, since we really, those language barriers are, are disappearing or, or have disappeared for the most part, um, then are we back to the tower, are we back to this like it was then in, in, in Shinar, um, this, at this place where the Tower of Babel was, and, um, you know, is this, in other words, is this a bad thing that we're able to communicate again? And, and should we should we not be trying to communicate so much? No, because we're all they're spread out. We're spread out more now, so that you can communicate the gospel to somebody over on the other side of the world, where they were all focused on themselves. You know? Okay. All right. And then when God spread them out, that was the objective, right? Okay. Spread, yeah. All right. You know? So that's all right. One way of looking at it is. That it's it's a good thing in that we can share the gospel, just like Pentecost. That we can communicate the gospel to all different people all over the world. This this study goes out and anybody in the world can can watch it. And in fact, people from all over the world will be watching. Okay, and have watched it. Um, my my sermons are people listen to them all over the world. Um, all right. Does anyone see anything bad about being able to communicate? with each other. I don't need it. United Nations, they, all the countries don't get along, that's for sure. All right. Yeah, they, they, it's all, 
even though you can communicate with them. This one has their viewpoint, and this one has their viewpoint, and mm -hmm. we still have war, war going yeah. on because countries yeah. aren't getting along. Yep, it hasn't solved war. No. And it's, it never will be. <clears throat> it's a very political just to be a member of the United Nations. You know, some people are refused. You know, yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, so it's like, and it, and it doesn't always work as planned either. Yeah. Um, you know, you look at the the Human Rights Council, and it's like, who's on the Human Rights Council? I'm trying to remember now, but it's like, um, it's basically every country that's that's on the Human Rights Council has a bad human rights record. <laughs> <laughs> They're all, it's all um, these countries that that are. Um, you know, like I don't know, China, I think, is one of them. And, and they're all countries that persecute their people, that are either religious persecution or, or, or some other kind of, yeah. of, of persecution going on, government-sanctioned persecution going on in their country. And they're on the Human Rights Council. Well, yeah. their standards are very low, so I guess it would be easy to agree with each other then, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> I guess, but the, the problem is it's the blind leading the blind. Yeah, it's, it's not going to accomplish anything, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> no, and, and if anything, what it does is it rubber stamps what they're doing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like, well, the United Nations said it's okay. <laughs> you know, and just, uh, you know, as an example, this is, is something that that really kind of um, hit me uh, that somebody pointed out to me, it actually happened a few months ago, but it, it didn't make the news. And that is, all right, there's this list of, of things the United Nations says that um, nations are, are not allowed to persecute people based on these things. And it's like um, nationality, race, um, gender, religion. And on that list was sexual orientation. And this was specifically talking about um, about capital punishment. It wasn't just persecution in general or anything like that. It was capital punishment. You cannot kill somebody for these reasons. Okay? And to that I would say, yeah, you know, homosexuality should not be a capital offense. Um, uh, you know, it's really arguable whether it should even be a crime. Um, I, I would contend no, because it's something that people struggle with. And telling them, no, that's bad. And instead of, you know, trying to help them, it's, it's not going to do any good. Right. So, but this used to, um, all right, but so they used to say that if, if a person is, um, uh, you know, sort of leans in that direction, um, then, then you, you, you can't kill them for that. Now they remove that from the list. So now it's okay for, for you to kill people for that again. So even though we believe that that um, living a homosexual lifestyle is a sin, <laughs> to um, you know, for the United Nations to say, "Yeah, we're taking that off the list. Go ahead, <laughs> you can kill them if you want." <laughs> you know, even Christians should be standing up and saying, "Whoa, hold on a minute here. <laughs> That's not how you deal with this." You know, by making it a capital crime. So, yeah, the um. United Nations is far from um, from perfect, or it, it questionable even how effective it is. They they do, you know, accomplish certain things, um, but uh, you know, it, there's some question about how how much the the bad and the good, you know, what whether it's it's outweighed or not. Um, but the problem is, it's full of sinners. Well, it's just like the Senate and the House. They're, they're all get together, and they all want, and they all want something. And no matter what they do, you're not going to accomplish anything because everybody has to have what okay. they want their right. way. You know, that's a good example. <laughs> and their own never, agenda. Yeah. It'll never, it'll never happen. So yeah, we we didn't have to worry about Congress building a tower of Babel. <laughs> they could never agree <laughs> yeah. on how to finance it. <laughs> they just voted down that whenever they had it. Yeah, because yeah, because half of them would want to want raise taxes to to finance it, and and the other half would want to lower taxes. And the millions are saying, "You can't tax the you rich can't people. cut yeah. my <laughs> can't cut my millions of dollars out." So. So yeah, there's. I'm a billionaire, and you want to make me a millionaire? You can't do that. <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, so next question: How do you see the ecumenical movement as another kind of babble? Right. So here we're talking about churches cooperating with other churches of of different denominations. Sometimes 
sort of across not just sometimes you even have to the extent where like Christians, Muslims, Jews um working together, sometimes even worshiping together. Um and other times it's just talking about um it, it can be anything from uh working together for as like relief organizations um you know helping Haiti or something like that um it can be uh uh joint services it can be um there's also the world council of churches and and um and and they They've sort of lost their effectiveness. Um, I'm not sure how much they ever had, but um, and and I'm not really quite sure what they do that's of much value. Um, I think they support some charities and that, but they they sort of promote the idea of um, sort of can't we all just get along and set aside our problems or set aside our differences. Right. So is this a is this a, a Tower of Babel or not? We'll set aside our differences and do what? Well, then we can just we'll just pretend that we don't have any differences, and and then we don't have to have different denominations, and we don't have to have, um, you know, we can all just worship together and work together, and um, and then we won't argue anymore. <laughs> I've never had any. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. It would be like another battle. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I mean, now, on the one hand, can we work together to help people out? Yeah, absolutely. All right? Oh, you know, I'll work side by side with anybody when it comes to helping out my neighbor. All right? And I don't care whether you're a Christian or not. <clears throat> okay? I mean, I care, <clears throat> but not as far as helping my neighbor goes. <laughs> okay? Um, the as, as far as I'm concerned, our... Um, our relief organization, like Lutheran World Relief, they they don't do sort of spreading the gospel, all right. They just do relief, like the Red Cross, okay, um, which is good and bad. It it allows them to get into countries where the gospel is not allowed. They would not be able to go in there and help people if they were distributing the gospel along with whatever aid they're bringing. Okay, the bad thing is they're not sharing the gospel with people. Um, so it's it's a real trade off there. LCMS World Relief, they insist on sharing the gospel with people. Mm-hmm. So, but they're getting inside the country, so that's a start, and they certainly would be looked upon favorably by the people that they're helping. Yeah, right. And if the people find oh, not these that are they, Christians, not that the people they're helping could do any kind of research and look them up, and <laughs> you know, I mean, but yeah, yeah. So you know. And there's kind of a question about that. There was, yeah. I know, um, when I was in Iowa, the, the ladies were making quilts for Lutheran World Relief. All right. And, um, and then they found out that they're not allowed to, you know, to share the gospel along with that. Cause they wanted to, like, sew some little, uh, you know, Bible verses into the quilts or something like that. And no, can't do that. <laughs> well, okay, fine. So, well, we're still helping people, right? So, um, there's another organization when at, when all those hurricanes happened down south. Um, there's a, another organization um, that's called Lutheran Church Charities, and um, what they do is they um, it's it's a service organization of Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and and, um, and what they do is is they take they take donations and then distribute them where needed. They have an endowment that covers all their overhead costs so that every penny that's given to them for aid is um, is given directly to the people that need it. And, um, and what they do is they always give it, wherever the need is, they give it to a local church in that area in a lot, so that that church can distribute it. And, um, and that way, that also connects those people with a church. And um, so that they see the church and, and so that they know where to go 
for more help, not only whatever physical help they need, but spiritual help as well. And, um, and so they're very, it's a, it's a partnership there. And, um, well, we found out about them and, um, and so then they started working with them and then they could actually put little Bible verses and stuff, um, in the, and, and they, they could stitch in sort of where it was coming from. So people knew who made it and, and stuff like that. And, and they could do that kind of thing, uh, which they hadn't been allowed to before. And so they were really happy to do that instead. Um, but you know, there's still people in need, um, and, and we have to help them however we can. So I understand why Lutheran World Relief does what they do. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, they just, they want to help people out. And if it means that, that they can't share the gospel with those people, but they wouldn't be able to share the gospel with them anyway, then, okay. Um, so I got a little off track there, but, um, the, so you've got these relief organizations, all right? Christians work, working together um, for different things like that, all right? Which is very similar to um, to the Red Cross, right? But then you have um, sort of how how much can we work together before we have to say, now hold on a minute, all right? Now I'll give you an extreme example. Um, when we were uh, I was I was down in St. Louis and they had some flooding and I, I wasn't involved in the sandbagging but I I knew people that were and and um and they were telling me about it that sort of all the churches in the area um, by the river got together and they were sandbagging the river to protect the people's houses because the river was flooding and um and so so they're all it was it didn't matter who you were just you know come and and, and all the Christians were working together a little further down the river are the Wisconsin Synod Lutherans sandbagging by themselves and they wouldn't work together with the other Christians right because they see the fellowship as being sort of all or nothing and um and and so we in the Missouri Center we practice altar and pulpit fellowship but that's it you know beyond that it's you know you can if uh you know for instance we don't practice building fellowship and so if uh you know, if, if the local Methodist church would burn down and they needed a place to, um, to, to hold their services, um, if, if we agreed to allow them to use it here, we wouldn't be sort of breaking any theological rules by allowing them to use our building, right? It would just be helping out some fellow Christians in need, right? Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, even though all their teachings are not completely in line with ours. Now, would we allow uh, um, like Muslims to use our building? No, because our building is set aside for Christ to be glorified. Got the pews in the way for the mosque. <laughs> you know, they had to get on the ground. Yeah, well, it doesn't face east. <laughs> so, but uh, <laughs> they built it that way on purpose. <laughs> Well, actually, the <laughs> churches are normally built um, <clears throat> facing north and south. And there's a, and I, I forget how it works, but you've got like the Jerusalem side, the, um, I can't remember now, but there's, there's actually some tradition as far as the, uh, the alt, uh, the, the pulpit and the lectern, <clears throat> which one goes on the right or the left. And it, and it has to do with, with which direction the the church is facing, um, yeah. okay. relative, and then where which direction Jerusalem is, like the altar, or like do they can? Because I would say mm -hmm. that our church, like if you go by the door, it would face south. Right. Like, are, is that what, or is it? And, and I consider I, I, like where the altar is, that's like facing north. Yeah. Well, it's it's the the pulpit versus the lectern. And I can't remember how that works, but you'll find most churches, most traditional churches, face north and south. Sort of, if you walk up and down the the main aisle, you're you're either walking north or south, mm -hmm. not east and west. Uh, it's not always possible, depending on your property and you know where the road is and all that kind of stuff. But um, 
but that's it's kind of a traditional way of, of doing things. And that's, I, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I because look at all the churches. Yeah, now I'm going to have to yeah, check that yeah, out. Yeah, look at all the churches and... like on Sunday Road or like Field of Method, and I mean, it's, it's it's a north and south thing. Yeah. 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 Never thought yeah. of that. You know, I, I never knew that. Yeah. So, yeah, I learned and, something new tonight. And, well, and I don't know how much of the, you know, with all those other churches, how much of that's coincidence and how much is not. All right. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, a lot of churches nowadays are not really designed according to traditional church architecture sort of values and rules. The right. church, is it the church that opened a door? Is that the one on Blair Nagel? I was going to say there is one that's. Go- East, yeah, that face, east and west. That face, yeah, it, that goes east and yeah, west. Uh-huh. The front door faces mm-hmm. east. Yeah. So, so that's not a traditional church. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Should we tell them? No. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's logistical issues too. Yeah, it, you it's know, probably it's, where they got the cheapest property. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> or it's just and yeah. where the water was in the street. You know, I mean, uh-huh. they yeah. yeah they had no choice. You know, there's and there's there's a million Plus, reasons. Isn't, that's like one of those. It almost looks like a prefab thing. Mm-hmm. You mean million so, reasons why they they do it that way. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and like I say it's you know it's the sort of. <laughs> old obscure sort of tradition, you know. Um, I never heard that. Yeah, so. I know when they they build the church. When I went to uh, St. Rose's or off Detroit during Cleveland, mm-hmm. when they built the church, they had just a hall, like in their church was like down the basement. So they build the church on top of the on top of the hall. Sure. And yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Or you know, if a church. So it was all facing. I yeah. Guess, towards yeah. You get like these storefront churches length. and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> you don't have a choice. Of, I don't yeah, know. I don't think there was any other way they could have really made it like they, you know, had make it that way. So let me give you another example with this whole sort of ecumenical question. Um, I was talking to this is very early in my ministry. I was talking to a guy who was um, he was an ELCA pastor. Um, his wife was co pastor with him, so we definitely had some differences. Um, all right. But at the same time, you know, for the most part, he was pretty conservative when you know, he believed the Bible's the word of God. He just sort of looked at it a little differently. Um, and, um, and I had a lot of respect for him. And, and, um, and he was, I was talking to him, this was about the same time as uh, a document called the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification came out, and, um, or JDDJ. And, um, <laughs> that we knew that, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, remember that? There will be a test on that. Um, what it was, it was, it was the, the ELCA and, or, or maybe it was, I think it was the ELCA. Um, I was going to say Lutheran World Federation, but I think it was just the ELCA. And the Roman Catholic Church came out with this document saying, we both believe, right? They, the, it explained what we believe about forgiveness of sins and what it means that Jesus died for us and, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? And, it, and they, they wrote this up together. And then both church bodies sort of signed it and said, yes, we both agree with this. Okay? Neither one of them changed any of their teachings. But what they did is they used ambiguous words in this document. Words that, like, if you say grace, grace means something different to a Roman Catholic than it does to a Lutheran, right? So both of them could say we're saved by grace. I don't think a Catholic would say that. Well, not completely. <laughs> but you have to, they have to say it because the Bible says by grace are you saved in several places, all right? But if you but if you understand grace meaning we're you know the Roman Catholic understanding of grace is that um, God gives us the grace to be able to work out our salvation to um, you know to to he gives us the ability to do good works to save ourselves in, in a sense okay so in that sense yeah we're saved by grace you know without that grace we couldn't do the good works to save ourselves okay and and so there was they used all of those sort of terms in such a way that um, that both the Lutherans could read it through sort of Lutheran eyes and say, yeah, we agree with what this says. And the Catholics could read it through their eyes and, and, and their understanding and and they could say, yep, we agree with what this says. Mm-hmm. And they signed it, said, We're in agreement. Like, okay. Mm-hmm. 
You've disagreed for 500 years. Did the Pope agree to this? Yeah. Really? Right? Mm -hmm. You've you've disagreed for 500 years, and neither one of you changed a single teaching. And now you agree. What's wrong with this picture? (laughs) All right? So I was talking to this guy about this, and I said, Hey, you're an ELCA pastor. What do you think of this? You know, can you explain this to me? Because it doesn't make sense to me. And, and he says, all right, he says, no, I don't agree with this, all right? This is ridiculous because it's a sham. We're not really in agreement with them. We just found words that we could agree to use, <laughs> you know? And, and he says, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we teach the same thing. And he said, and the, the big problem with these kinds of things is that it takes those problems that we have, those differences, and it pushes them under the rug. And we pretend that there's no differences, but they're still there. And he said, and if you don't deal with them, they're never going to go away. And we're never going to reach any kind of understanding, right? Now you look at the history of the Christian church, all right? You look at, you look at the, the Nicene Creed, all right? What is the Nicene Creed? It's, it's I believe these things, all right? The words that were chosen for that creed were chosen through a series of councils that took almost a hundred years to work out the the details of it, okay? Why? Because they had a word just right, all right? Even words like, um, of the same substance, all right? There were huge debates over that word because that word had been used to mean something else. And they said, so can we use that word or are people going to get the wrong idea? It's the Greek word homoousios. That'll be on a test, too. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm missing the thing. You spell it. Yeah. (laughs) No, you couldn't. It's it's a Greek word. It's a different alphabet. (laughs) But it means the same stuff. You know? And, um, and, And so... But the purpose of that was to say, this is what we believe, all right? And we're being very specific about what we believe in order to say what they're teaching over there, that's not what we believe, all right? Because of holding to those teachings and saying, this is what the Christian faith teaches, because of that, we have those clear teachings today. Because they did the work of digging into scripture when some when people came along with these other teachings and they said, well, let's see what the Bible says about that. And they dug into it and they debated over it and they studied it and, and somebody said, well, what about this? And the person says, well, no, that's not right because of this. And, you know, and they went back and forth and they worked it out. It's not that they just said, well, the Pope said this, so that's the way it's going to go. You know, they, they dug into the scriptures and, and we still have those documents today where they wrote up these long treatises about this is what we believe and why. And, and we can see both sides of the argument and stuff like that. And, um, you know, and, and interest, just another little interesting aside, um, that uh, one, of the, one of the guys that was very influential in, in the writing of the Nicene Creed is St. Nicholas. Um, whose name well, today, in fact, or tonight, tomorrow, tomorrow. So Six. which December is sixth? Tonight, you know, is, <laughs> is is you know sort of Saint Nicholas night, right? Um, so, uh, but yeah, so he was one of the guys when we um, when we uh, confessed the Nicene Creed. He was one of the guys that gave that to us, and um, and so yeah, that stuff's important. And, um, and so, you know, when we say, let's just ignore all our differences, um, we're just, we're building a Tower of Babel. Did they cover Martin Luther or no? What's that? Did they cover Martin Luther in this agreement? Um, uh, oh, no. No. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just wondering if maybe, you know, the Pope was okay with him now. <laughs> no. No. Okay. No, he's, he still hasn't been canonized or anything. Then how... <laughs> when is then it... How could they say that, oh, okay, well, okay. The... well no, no, see, you have to understand. 
the Roman Catholic, when we talk about the ecumenical movement, all right, for Protestant churches, it's can't we all just get along, all right? The Roman Catholic view of the ecumenical movement is, well, you're all under the Pope anyway, whether you realize it or not. <laughs> so, well, whatever you want, thing. fine, the Pope's still the head over you. <laughs> and, and so, you know, for them, it's... It, they and and that's something that doesn't get talked about much either because it's very um um what's the word um insulting uh you know to the other churches to the protestant churches so um <laughs> oh that's fine you just go on and think what you want to think the pope's still your leader <laughs> and pope never wanted to change either he never whatever they he said that's the way it was going to be. He never wanted to change. Yeah, and, and the day, you know, there's there yeah, have been most some changes. Of my life, I was Catholic, and it just yeah, they had changed, slow changes as they went along. But for years there, no matter what it was, he was setting his way. Whatever he said, that was the way it was going to be, and his way or no way. <laughs> well, yeah, and um, but uh, look, they, look at some done, of the changes that they're talking about now. Yeah, they're going to using con condoms, you know. That was AIDS. that was blown out of proportion. He he basically said that would be a lesser of two evils in in extreme situations. He never said it was okay. What I heard, um, we were talking about religion at church, and one of our student workers who went to a Catholic high school at work. Pardon me. At work. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, she's a, so she's a college student, and she went to a um, Catholic high school, and um, she said, "Oh, we covered the Bible, you know, when I was in high school." And I said, "Well, then that's improved since." <laughs> and she said, "But um, they teach us that there's stories like fables," and I said, "Excuse me." They don't teach you that it's the word of God, and she goes, "No." They're just stories that are open to, into, really? yeah. And, and I said, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was, I was stunned. And I said, I don't know what's worse, <laughs> the fact that, in all my years of Catholic schooling, schooling never once did they ever ask us to open up a Bible, or the fact that they're dismissing it as. I would tend to think that that's not true of every or even most Catholic schools. It's, I hope not. It's certainly not the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. I know our um, our high school was so much more liberal than the, than the grade school was. Um, so I'm thinking maybe because of where her high school was, you know, maybe it was just you know that could to get be. the kids to I don't know come I don't know the you know it, it's just like in any church body even even in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod all right you've got variety not just in practice oh, all yeah. right you've got a lot of variety in practice I mean you talk you know let's talk communion fellowship and and what who do you admit to the table and who don't you that varies drastically. From church to church. Mm -hmm. All right. Or even in the same church from pastor to pastor. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and a lot of that's because the way that our um, our position is written up, it allows for the pastor to make exceptions in exceptional circumstances. Well, the problem is in any given circumstance, every pastor sees it a little bit differently. And um, and, to, and he, he's got, you know, it, you don't make those exceptions lightly, but some people look at the culture and say, our culture is an exceptional circumstance, you know, and there may come a day that, um, that commu our communion fellowship will be drastically different than it is now, just because like, for instance, you go to other countries, all right, you go to, you know, for instance, Indonesia, okay, in Indonesia, you've got Catholics and Christians or Protestants, all right? That are basically Lutheran, okay, um, but they don't have Lutherans and Methodists and you know and all of that because there's not enough Christians to split up like that. They need each other. They need to to come together. And and so 
you know, they don't, um, they don't have those distinctions. That, that's no Tower of Babel. <laughs> that's that's one little tribe, you know, uh, you know, and they've got some big churches there, right? But um, but they they all hold to the same teachings, and and but in you know in places like that, you don't really except for the the Catholics keep with the Catholics and the Protestants keep with the Protestants. But um, you know, besides that, you don't really get into questions of of communion, fellowship, and things like that because Christians Christian there. Um, and that's because you know, but but here, that's also because that um, in a place like that, you don't get the the really weird teachings that we get in America, where you have you know Christian pastors standing up and saying the Bible's fables, All right? It's not the word of God and stuff, and we say, whoa, hold on a minute here, All right? So in our culture. In, in in our not only in in America but in our um, our culture as a church in America as, as Christianity in America, we need to take a stand and say you know what we can't be all united we can't just build a big tower, okay, um, because that big tower would be all about us, right? So um, and and it would be it's it would be unity for the sake of unity, um, and not for the sake of, of the truth. Um, in, in, a, in a persecuted country, they're unified to proclaim the truth um, to those who don't have Christ. Um, but here it's, it's like unity just for the sake of, so that we can have joint services and the potluck dinner afterward or something, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's not for the sake of getting the gospel out. And, and, and ultimately, what it does is it just leads to a lot of infight. Um, I had a good friend of mine back in Iowa was a pastor at the local UCC church. And, um, and, and he was, except for his view of the sacraments, the guy could have been a Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor. I kept telling him, you should really <laughs> just go to the seminary, you know, and, and you could get colloquized and be out in two years. And, you know, um, I mean, he was just, he was a really good guy. And, and, I, and, but he would, he gets so frustrated with, at his church because half of them were Bible believing, you know, conservative, everything, you know, um, in their theology. And the other half were, it was like anything goes. And, and so he's, he's constantly dealing with these two sides arguing with each other. And like, How can you be one church when you're so divided? And he said, the UCC is all about uniting, um, you know. But it's but the, you're not really united. It's 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 fake. It's, it's mm -hmm. you're you're using the same name, but you've got two different churches meeting in the same building at the same time, you know. And um, and it was nothing but headaches because every time he would take a stand for the the Bible or anything like that, he'd get into all kinds of trouble with his church leadership. Or half of them, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, what kind of... Everyone has a different Bible? Everyone believes differently? Well, no. Some people say that you can pick and choose from the Bible. If but you I mean, like in, their, in, their, in their unity churches, each one had a different Bible? No. So like the, no, but only half of them believed it. They <laughs> own the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, I think I... All right. So, which I, I think I, I sort of answered the next question. Have you ever seen churches act like the people of Shinar? All right. Now, a lot of churches just have a lot of infighting and, you know, they could never build a tower together. They can't even decide on the color of the carpeting. You know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, um, it, but some churches, they do. They say, so, okay, well, we're just going to, we're going to push God out of the way so that we can have a big church. I mean, all right. And, and in, in fact, you know, a lot of the big churches out there, they've built an empire and that empire is not focused on Christ. It's focused on the pastor. You know, just turn on your TV and, and, and flip to a, um, to a, a religious program. And, um, chances are you're going to end up with, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's an old thing I used to listen to is uh, there's a um the it's a group called the Ubers. 
uh, referring to the UP, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, and uh, and they had they would do this bit. It was Reverend Jerry, send me money. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just you know it, it was just that um, yeah, send me money and, and I'm gonna build. You know you have people like um, Robert Schuler um, who would refuse to use the word sin um, in in his preaching and teaching because it would make people feel bad. Um, and, he, and he was upfront about it. I mean, I'm not like making this up. I mean, he was, I, I listened to an interview where he said, no, I won't, I won't use that. You know? Um, and, uh, or, you know, you've got, uh, Joel Osteen and, um, and you know, if God loves you and he's going to make you rich, <laughs> Um, <laughs> you're the you're kingdom kids, you know. You're, you're children of the king, and so children of the king should be rich, right? <laughs> so that's not the kind of riches that you know that Jesus came to bring us. He came to bring us a whole lot better than that. Um, but uh, you know, there's there's a lot of that kind of stuff out there. But yeah, most of it is it's not centered on Christ. It's not centered on the Word of God. It's not to glorify God. It just it makes people feel good, which. There's your tower. It's all about us. All right. Has God ever knocked down one of your personal towers? Yeah, it got me out of the Catholic religion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. You ever worked towards something and, and, and you worked really hard at it and then, um, and then you realized that it wasn't right? Or... Or it, it, it fell apart and you realized afterward, oh, it's a good thing that fell apart? Or that you were neglecting things that you shouldn't have and people you shouldn't have? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> that's a, yeah, that's a great example. And that's, that's probably a, a very common one mm -hmm. um, for us is that there's so many things pulling at us in all directions and it's really mm -hmm. easy to get wrapped up in something um, that's, and then, messing up our priorities man i i was i've been you know I've, I've been listening to over the past several months a lot of church leadership stuff and there was one time it was it was like an all-day seminar on um of, of just all these sort of successful pastors and all right you've got 10 minutes whatever you want to say you can say it you know and it would just go from from one guy to the next like a third of them were don't neglect your family. <laughs> <laughs> this is the biggest advice I can give you. There was one guy I learned from this. He says, he says, I've been happily married for three years. I've been married for 15. But I've been happily married for three. That sounds like a wreck. And, and, it was, and he said, what it came down to is, I was putting everything else ahead of my wife. And then I realized three years ago, I got to stop this because everything is falling apart and I'm going to not just lose my marriage, I'm going to lose my ministry, I'm going to lose everything, and I've got to get my priorities straight. And, um, but God talked about that too. You know, he, he warned Timothy about that, that you got to have your own house in order before you can deal with God's house. And, um, so. I'm kind of in a situation myself sometimes, I... I try to help people, you know, and I think I'm doing good for them, and then at the end, I get stabbed for it. It's like, why did I do that? But my question, my own self is, why why can't I stop? What what can I do to stop myself? Because I, I want to stop, but yet I, I was never brought up or raised that way, and I've always, you know, wanted to help people and do things like that. And... Uh, now I want to stop it because I just I get hurt. <laughs> well, you know. I don't know how. I wish I could. That makes sense. You know, you know the old saying: "No good deed ever goes unpunished." You know, and 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 sadly, there's some truth to that. Yeah. Um, but uh, at the same time, you know. Jesus said, "Bless are you when they persecute you, and, and that because of my name." And um, but rejoice in your and be glad because yours is the kingdom of God. And um, and so yeah, you know, when we reach out into the community and, and share the gospel with people and, and stuff, that, you know, we're gonna get we're gonna get 
negativity from people. Um, people are going to get offended. What do you mean I'm a sinner? Okay, I'm not telling you that to make you feel bad. I'm telling you that so that, so that you can know that there's someone who forgave your sins. <laughs> you know, and well, what do you mean I'm a sinner? You know, but, you know, missing the point. And and so that's that's something that we run into. And and um, so the the trick is is not to worry about offending people or even what's going to happen to us because we offended people. We just follow Christ and and. Um, keep serving our neighbor even if it backfires on us. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, so, hey, let's stop just, it. That's what I yeah. Do. Just, you know, take it's it back like, to God I and say, I reached the point where I can't, you know, do it anymore because of my, I gotta look after myself, you know. Well, it, it can certainly get frustrated or frustrating, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> you all have to, Figure that, yeah. The um, look at look at Jesus went around helping people, and look what they did to him. Yeah. Yeah, but he kept doing it, knowing full well what was yeah. going to happen to him. So. Yeah, I just want to say more. All right, let's close it. Heavenly Father, we so often uh, build monuments to ourselves in our lives. We um, we try to we we want to feel good about ourselves and and. Um, and it's just so easy to, to pursue our own paths and, and to forget about your path for our lives because often the path you lay before us seems impossible to us. Um, and, and oftentimes it is impossible just for us, but with you all things are possible. And so just open our eyes to your hand in our lives and the path that you lay before us and give us faith to walk boldly down that path uh, to and serving our neighbor along the way, knowing that that path leads to eternal life. We pray in Jesus' name.